This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist who wanted to extend the walls of my practice five years ago, almost five and a half now, to those of you who might already be very interested in psychological and emotional issues. Maybe you're already in therapy. To those of you who might just have been diagnosed with something or you're looking for answers either individually or in your relationship, but also to another group of you. To those of you who might be a little doubtful, if not more than doubtful, about therapy, about mental health treatment in general, but you're just curious enough or, sadly, unhappy enough to listen in to something like self-work. Self-work isn't therapy, but at least it gives you an idea of what mental health clinicians like me, how we think, and what therapy might be like. I want to give a brief warning. There are references made in this episode to childhood abuse and suicidal thoughts in an attempt, so please listen with caution. And I've given you the International Suicide Prevention Hotlines and resources in the show notes. But I do want to say, Lynn Barrett is a guest you'll never forget listening to. She suffers from dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder, and now manages a fully functional life as part of her healing process with an eye to helping others with DID, as it's called, Lynn Barrett wrote her own memoir. She's a retired teacher, a school principal, and pastor, and she was diagnosed with DID in 1992. And after years of very, very intense therapeutic work, she now lives what she calls a happily integrated life. In her book, Crazy, Reclaiming Life from the Shadows of Traumatic Memory, she takes us through her journey from happy wife and mother to internally living with more than 10 distinctive personalities, or what are called alters. Her opening quote in the book is, Trauma freezes the memory narrative. It is the task of survivors of early childhood trauma to thaw it out and turn it into a story. What an eloquent way of putting it. She also reminds us, that dissociative disorders affect about 2% of the U.S. population. She says that's about the same as redheads. What is dissociative disorder? It is a persistent mental state that is marked by feelings of being detached from reality, being outside of one's own body, or experiencing memory loss or amnesia. Often misdiagnosed, DID is known predominantly to be caused by severe severe childhood trauma combined with a disorganized attachment style. When long-term child abuse occurs before that child's typical personality integration occurs around age nine, the healthy state of the singular self may be disrupted, meaning your identity as just one person. The experience of memory loss of time, people, and events, and it could be any of those, can result in two or more distinct and separate identities that serve as a coping mechanism to function within the abuse. I want you to know that even within the psychiatric community, there are people that don't believe that DID should exist as a sole diagnosis. I don't happen to be in that group, as I've treated several people with DID, and to me, it is very, very different from something like severe borderline disorder. So that's my stance, and I think you'll learn a lot. But before we get to the interview, I want you to hear from Athletic Greens or AG1. They have a fantastic offer for you. It's a full year supply of D3 and K2, which is just a tiny little drop that you put in your morning drink. And I know that it's a year supply because I'm just finishing up my bottle, which I got a year ago when... AG1 started sponsoring the podcast. So give it a listen and consider their offer. Our partner, AG1, has a product I use every day. I started taking Athletic Greens, frankly, because they were interested in sponsoring self-work, and I never recommend something to you without trying it first. With one scoop of AG1, whose taste is somewhere between sweet and tart to me, You'll get 75 high-quality minerals, vitamins, probiotics, adaptogens, and whole food source superfoods, which support everything from your gut to your immune system to your energy level. 
I love it because whether I'm home and about to go out for a walk or traveling and about to spend time with friends and family, I can start my day proactively, knowing I'm doing something for my own self-care. If you're like me, self-care can get lost for sure. In fact, its founder, after having severe gut issues, realized he was taking over $100 a day worth of supplements, which had their own very complicated dosage routine, so he created Athletic Greens. To make it easy, and because you're a self-work listener, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is to visit athleticgreens.com slash self-work. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash self-work to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. But now please sit back and learn how intensive abuse can be lived through and healed and how your wonderful, spectacular mind really acts to protect you. So I want to welcome you, Lynn, to self-work. I am delighted. I I have worked with some people with dissociative identity disorder in my own practice, Mm -hmm. and I learned a lot from reading your book about some things I could try that would be helpful. First, I kind of wanted to start at the end of the story instead of the beginning of the story. Sure. I wanted you to tell people what DID is and how are you now? Okay. Yes, well... Sometimes it's good to start at the end (laughs) before we go to the beginning. And in this case, it's really a happy ending story, but it had, it was not a happy story for, for many, many, many years of my life. So I will talk a little bit about dissociative identity disorder. And I, I usually begin by explaining what dissociation is so people understand that because everyone dissociates a little bit uh, now and then in their lives. And it's a sort of a temporary separation of the mind and the body. And so just think about um, if you are sitting in a lecture hall with a really boring lecturer, you know, <laughs> never happens, um, never. Yeah, never happens right? Uh, but you know, you're right by the window, and, and you're looking out the window, and there are the kids playing soccer on the field right outside the window. And so your mind sort of separates from your body and ends, it goes out there and you're, you're with the kids out there. And you forget all about what's going on inside. Uh, you don't hear your professor lecturing, and you are somewhere else. That's dissociation at its very basic level. But because dissociation does separate the mind from the body a little bit, it has a protective uh, function as well. Exactly. And so a soldier uh, on the battlefield uh, might experience dissociation to protect himself from the horror that's all around him. When he leaves the battlefield and comes back to real life, he may carry some of that dissociation with him. The same is true for women who are raped. The dissociation they experience helps to protect them from the full impact of what's happening to them in the moment. But when the the rape is over and they come back into real life, they may carry some of that dissociation with them. So that kind of gives you a general sense of what dissociation is. In dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder, exactly, and in fact, that was that was what I was diagnosed with in 1993, and about two years later, it was changed to dissociative identity disorder. So, in the case of children whose uh, minds are not fully developed, our brains don't fully develop until s- somewhere between the age of six and ten. So when a child experiences trauma of some sort, the child may also dissociate. In the case of trauma that is repetitive, that happens chronically over and over again, often that is perpetrated by people that the child relies on, perhaps the child's parents or the child's guardians or neighbors or relatives, people that the child has to rely on for some sense of protection. It's kind of a big conundrum for that child that the people who protect them are also the people who hurt them. And so um, this 
separation of mind body, this dissociation is a protective coping strategy that the ch- small child uses in order to be able to survive the abuse and then go back and uh, rely on these people without remembering what happened. So the the either the event or the abuse or the emotion can get locked into a part of the brain that doesn't communicate with another part of the brain. Mm-hmm. So so the brain, the part of the brain that goes out in real life has no idea that this is going on because it's locked away in this other part of the brain. But I want to add also that these parts uh, that I'm talking about, and they're, we call them alters, we call them insiders. We Everybody has a different name for personas, them. Personas, all that kind of thing. Right, personas. Some people call them headmates. So they might hold uh, the memories of uh, abuse. They might hold the emotions. But they also sometimes hold uh, special skills or purposes. Talent. Yeah, yes, that exactly. That's right. So they hold all kinds of different parts of us that indeed actually are a part of us, uh, but they're separated off. You know, there's a it's not a new theory, but it's a newer theory of the way to do therapy is called internal family systems. And the founder of that, Richard Schwartz, says we all have a form of multiple personalities where we all have parts of us that are more vulnerable and parts of us that are more protective and parts of us that are, you know, whole anger. And again, I don't mean to diffuse actual DID because of that, but it's kind of an interesting theory that has been evolving. One of the analogies I have used in the past to try to help my own patients with DID understand if a windshield gets exposed to enough trauma, enough pressure, it will crack, yes. but the windshield stays intact. It, it, there's a crack in it, and there's a distinct this part and that part, but the windshield doesn't break. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you add more and more trauma and you get more and more cracks, but there is a totality of the windshield. And at the same time, there are these different parts that are Well, of course, those are visible, but that are invisible and that help bear the weight of the trauma. Yes, that's a beautiful analogy, I think. And I often find that uh, people who have just been recently been diagnosed uh, with DID can have sometimes very negative feelings about their alters or their parts Mm -hmm. and and because they don't know and sometimes the very often some of the parts are difficult (laughs) Uh, and it's before you've done any communication with them and so it's just this this is just craziness and they've ruined my life and that sort of thing and I try to remind people that uh, they saved your life they are difficult right now but they saved your life and it is through communicating with them and hearing their stories and helping them communicate with each other, that um, we bring down those amnesic walls, and we actually can begin to heal. Your book was divided into, your book, which is about, it's called Crazy, um, is divided into three time blocks, and they are long time blocks. They're not nine months and 15 months. It This literally took you quite a long time yes. to, to understand what exactly was going on, and would it be accurate that you had a persona or an altar that one of her wonderful skills was mothering? And mm-hmm. since that was your primary role at the time, that that did that sort of fend off the idea that there might be, I know you had these things that you would, you would sense and hear and feel these icicles that would come on when you were triggered and you didn't understand. And I have, I have a quote from you that says, it's like you. I was looking through a veil and something had been started in my body for decades and you began to have this gradual recognition of, it was interesting, you didn't talk about in the book, which I've heard other people with DID talk about, these periods of time that you didn't remember. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear you talk about that. It was more, you became more and more aware of what you called competencies versus craziness and this divergence of those two parts of you became more and more evident to you yes well so yeah one of the um the the 
DSM, which is the psychiatric yeah. book that it's like a Bible of, of not sure it should be, but that is diagnosis. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so it requires that to have a diagnosis of DID is to uh, have more than one fully formed personality and to experience some form of amnesia, but the amnesia can come in different uh, ways. And I did not lose time. At least I was not aware of losing time, as many people do. Um, I, I had amnesia between my parts, and I had amnesia for for large chunks of my childhood and also for specific uh, evidence uh, uh, or, or memories, uh, uh, oh, cognitive yeah. memories of abuse. You know, I had uh, a constant body memory and uh, constant fragments and snippets and voices in my head, but I didn't have I didn't have those really full on narrative memories that we might expect when we don't really understand what um, traumatic memory looks like and how it develops and how it manifests in people. So you're you're right. I did not talk about uh, time loss because I didn't experience that. And I, uh, although my alters did not initially know about each other, I did experience a good deal of co-consciousness. Um, so that Can you explain what that is. I know what you're talking about, but just sure, somebody. sure. Well, that's when when your different parts are out and they're aware of each other. So often, I as the host was looking on at what um, another part of me was saying or doing or even feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, I might be up in the corner of the room. And the ceiling, looking down and watching myself do something or uh, experience something, and but I wasn't a part of myself, so I was separate, but I was conscious of what was happening. That's a great explanation of that term. I want to tell my listeners that, for one thing, I have seen patients with this. I've only gotten to work with two extensively. Mm-hmm. And uh, very carefully and reading everything I could get my hands on because I've not been specifically trained in dissociative identity disorder. But I'm in Fable, Arkansas, and, you know, <laughs> I had to do it. And I just tried to educate myself as much as I could. But I, I do believe this is real. There is divergence in the mental health field itself, whether this is truly uh, a disorder. And I am of the ilk that it is. I don't think it's a severe borderline disorder, borderline personality disorder. I think it is something different. And so to those of you who have seen movies like that, what is your take on on Hollywood's version of DID? Uh, Well, first of all, I have to say, and I I adore Kim, (laughs) but but, but when she first brought up the Sybil analogy, you know, and it was sort of sensationalized, uh, and I said, oh, no, you don't want to go that direction, Uh, you know, because in some sense, I feel as if I'm representing a whole community of people, um, and and I I wanted it to be authentic and real and true and honest, and uh, and in in saying that, I uh, am not suggesting that Sybil wasn't true, real, and honest. But that's a whole nother um, story when we get into the Hollywoodization of uh, DID. And um, to be honest, I can't genuinely say one thing or another because I don't watch that stuff. I don't want to watch it. I accidentally watched something a few years ago with my husband. The show was called Evil, and it was actually a little campy, and we we enjoyed it for all. But several times, they were going to do an exorcism of uh, oh someone, God. and the psychologist they said, "Well, no, I think this person has dissociative identity disorder," and it just made me cringe because it is there is a lot out there that is inaccurate and sensationalized. And part of my reason for not only writing my memoir, but also appearing on podcasts with you and others is to um, destigmatize it and to make it easily understandable. I want to say, first of all, in the past 30 years, there has been a tremendous amount of research on dissociative identity disorder and dissociative disorders and trauma in early childhood. And I believe it was a 19, 
at 95 study published in the Harvard uh, Review of Psychiatry that said that there's between one and three percent of the population worldwide that has either diagnosed or undiagnosed DID. It is not rare. That's if you go to church and there's a hundred people in the in the pews, <laughs> probably between one and three people have either diagnosed or undiagnosed DID. This is a um it's it's the body's natural response for a child when the child's experiencing chronic abuse. And the problem is, I think, that we don't want to believe there's that kind of abuse out there. Exactly. And that's yeah. the point that Bessel van der Kolk makes when he talks about development yes. trauma, that he's been trying to get that in the DSM-5 for years, and they fight him on it. I think you and I are simpatico <laughs> about that, because I, I agree that that's the, uh, that's the motivation. So one of the things that was so striking for me was how when you were hospitalized finally, that, and of course you got wonderful treatment from Sonia, that was such a fantastic relationship, but that your father, who was your abuser, Mm -hmm. he was involved in the abuse, was just saying things like, you know, don't let them pull things out of you. There's fake memory. It was so transparent that he was doing whatever he could to to convince you that that don't go looking because you won't find anything. And if you do, you know, it will be it was he was threatening you, basically. Yes, that is true. And it, it, it was striking to me, too. And my father, I mean, I think it's interesting that you said that he was the abuser because I suspect that he was, but that I I never actually accused him because my parts never uh, actually identified him. uh, That's why I changed it to he he was involved in your abuse because I caught myself. Rosie climbed up on his lap, but she never told me who his was. And Rosie was a two-year-old girl. So think of your own uh, children or grandchildren at the age of two uh, and and, and the cognitive awareness that they have. You know, she loved him. She she trusted him. She climbed up on there because she loved him. Because he loved her or she thought he loved her. But when her, when, when she experienced the abuse, she handed it off to, to Nanny, Nanny. Uh, who took that, who took the abuse. And so she, so that way she could climb up on his lap again. And I, I know people listening in will say, well, what do you mean you don't know who uh, abused you? And, uh, so I, I, I wish that I could explain that clearly. And, but I probably can't. Uh, because I don't know. And I just had to learn uh, to accept that and to trust that. But regarding who may have done the abuse, who may have perpetrated it, what I like to describe is uh, I have a bird feeder outside. And I, every time I look, I can never see a bird because they never come when I'm looking. <laughs> they never <laughs> come when I'm there. But at the bottom of the on the ground, there are all these little seed casings. And the seed casings tell me that the that the the birds have been there. Well, if you read the book, you'll see that there are so many little seed casings that are clear and cognitive memories of mine that exactly. um, tell you well something happened here. And I never ever accused my father of abusing me, and yet I received letters in the mail with articles about. Uh, false memory syndrome. And I'm thinking to myself, I mean, this was early in my therapy, and I really didn't know who uh, had hurt me. And I'm thinking, well, why is he sending me this? Why is he telling me this? Uh, I I don't know why he's doing that. And then I was disowned by my family. My mother disowned me and my father uh, did the same thing. And then they began to invite my ex-husband, who had been cheating on me, to (laughs) to their uh, holiday meals and and not me, you know, so I was sidelined, I was uh, pushed aside, I was told to not look at the hobgoblins of my past. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of um, seed casings that uh, tell me that this is where it came from, uh, that, that, that in some way, I, I don't know the whole story. I, I never did know the whole story. And, and this is for those of your listeners who may have 
um, DID or some other manifestation of early childhood abuse, mm -hmm. that it is possible to heal even without putting all the pieces together. However, having said that, I'd also say, but you still have to do so much work, really, really hard work um, uh, to go inward uh, uh, and, and to start to uncover all the things that you do know and all of the um, emotions that you have that you've been stuffing. Um, so it is very, very hard work to heal from early childhood abuse. I've been told that uh, some people call it soul murder because it is the um, it, it, it's it's the very core of who we are, and um, it, 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 particularly our sexuality is the core of who we are, and it's been uh, damaged, and it's been um, uh, the boundaries have been crossed um, sometimes cruelly and certainly frequently. It's always cruel, but sometimes it's intentionally cruel. I mean, sometimes the abuse happens not so much with intentionality, but because the perpetrator is just acting out, you know, their own past or their needs on a small child. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, so I'm, I'm suggesting that's not as intentional as w when you have people who are intentionally wanting to cross these boundaries and utilize the child for other purposes. I, I won't go into it on the podcast, but you have a, an event that you describe that involved your wrists and that kind of thing that are that is very cruel. Again, you have fragments of memories about it, but it seemed it to me in the book that it was. And, I, and I, I tried to be very honest that it was. These are fragments. I, I, I don't want. I, I don't, don't want to take a fragment. And, and, and turn it into a full-blown memory yes. if I didn't, if that's not what I had. No. If I had a full-blown memory, then I, I wanted to share that. But if I, if I wanted to share, if I had a fragment, I wanted to share the fragment. And to show this is what happens with traumatic memory. And this is true even with adults. When ad so an adult will not get DID, but an adult will get PTSD. Mm -hmm. and, and an adult will experience fragments as well uh, mm -hmm. you know this is how the body protects us from trauma exactly. Exactly. Um, and and the body and the mind protect us from trauma and um, it is just devastating so uh, you wanted to start with the end in mind and and so I am a happy woman and I'm integrated and I, I have a very fulfilled life and I think I uh, understand my past as well as I can at this point in time but having said that, and I also want to tell people that this was a good 20 years or more of sheer hell. Uh, it was constant psychic pain. I was in constant suicidal ideation. I didn't know who I was. I had multiple strands of thought going through my head at the same time. And I also had my feelings and, and my emotions and my thoughts didn't match up you know they weren't connected it, and it was just unbearable and I want to make sure I say that because sometimes when I speak because I am articulate and I have uh, integrated people can think this is not all that bad right. but it is that bad it is it is really really terrible and at the same time as you noted earlier, I was uh, going into a classroom and teaching and doing a great job. And then I became a principal and I was really good at what I did. So I had parts who could go in and do that work. Um, and then when I went home, uh, they sort of backed away and my emotional parts uh, that had not yet processed uh, the past would come out and take over and yeah. just and consume me. I loved the idea of consensus versus voting. And <laughs> you learned that in the Quaker community mm -hmm. you were drawn to. And the reason why I love it so much is that in my own work, some of the altars or personas or whatever have been afraid that what my goal was was for them to be destroyed. 
yes. for them to disappear. I did not think about consensus, um, and that's one of the things I learned from your book. I've made it akin to, I just want you all at the same table, and whoever, you know, the skills that you each have can be honored, and the vulnerabilities that you each have can be honored at the same time. And that takes a lot of coordination and a lot of trust and a lot of care. And I, I loved that, and because... It's just something to move forward with. It's an it's a concept of where we want to go, and and so I think probably people listening would also want to know. So you've mentioned Rosie and Nanny, and Rosie being very young, and Nanny also being a very early protector of Rosie. Can you talk a little bit about some of the other altars that served a certain purpose or bore a certain pain that you? you had sure. associated from? Yeah, um, the first uh, two that I would mention beyond Rosie and Nanny. And it's interesting because they seem to come in twos. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, but uh, were Sylvia and Mike, and they were teenagers, and they were twins. Um, and they were really very important in, in my system. And, and system is the word we use to describe uh, all of our altars and how they work to with each other or or how they work together. But um, Sylvia held my sexuality and my sensuality. Mm -hmm. And um, Mike held my anger. And so they were, and they were twins. So it's kind of like two sides of of a coin, you know? Mm -hmm. And I I would say that there were other altars who also held anger beyond Mike, but that was his M.O., Mm -hmm. And um, he, uh, through his sort of limited but focused teenage perspective, was so, I guess I can't curse on this um, podcast. You know, go ahead. (laughs) He was so damn angry, you know, that my life had gotten off track. And he just did everything he could to help get me back on track. And and so he had all this anger in him, but he used it for good for me because he wanted me in a, in a sense, I think he was a protector too, because he wanted me to, he wanted me to get back on track. And so it was through his anger, I think that I was able to begin to, um, well, first of all, I was able to, to experience anger before he came on the scene. I mean, I never got angry. I didn't know how to get angry. I was not allowed to get angry. I was raised to never get angry. So um, uh, with with Mike on the scene, I learned how to get angry. But I also learned, how, with the help and guidance of my therapist, I learned how to be angry appropriately and at the right people. Uh, and and uh, often my anger wasn't really I thought I wanted to direct it at one person, but it really belonged somewhere else, you know. So I learned how to be effectively angry, appropriately angry. And Mike continues today in my life to enable me to be an assertive person and to get angry appropriately when when I need to. Mm-hmm. And uh, But I could not do any of that before he showed himself on the scene because he had been hidden, uh, you know, under the surface of my neurons, you know. But when he came forward, he was a, a very important part of my, my healing. Sylvia, his twin, who held the sexuality, I, I think was also a lifesaver for me. Because on the one hand, I will say she, my uh, sexuality was also very hidden. I didn't have much contact with it at all until she came, uh, introduced herself. And she was um, not always sensible, like sometimes teenagers are not sensible in how they use their sexuality and actually put me in danger a few times. Then I learned, I taught her how to be safe uh, and sensible with her sexuality. And, but she, she gave me the opportunity of being just joyful when I was miserable, you know, like the rest of me was suicidal. The rest of me 
was catatonic on bed on the bed uh, and and could barely move out of a fetal position. And Sylvia would say, oh, I want to go dancing, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, let's do something fun. Let's have a party, you know. And so it was like she she was life saving, too, because she she and enabled me to uh, to do some fun things, even when I was like close to death internally, at least, you know, I did uh, attempt suicide once. And I never did it again because somebody in, inside of me, and I don't really know who, who, who it was, said, if I ever do this again, I'm going to succeed. I'm not failing at this the next time. And and so the rest of me, you know, just um, sort of uh, protected me from uh, actually carrying it out. But I felt suicidal for probably two decades, you know, mm-hmm. um, and um yeah, because it was so hard to live. So, so I today I lead writers' workshops for uh, people with dissociative disorders, and um, you know, I, I just I think I can say this without you know revealing anything. I, I just read a piece of writing that's been submitted, you know, from a brilliant uh, person and a very accomplished person, and uh, describing how suicidal she is and how the world she would be better off if she weren't alive and uh, you know the the world will be better off and those are the things that that I used to say so we have these parts of us that are suicidal and with luck uh, or with hard work we have other parts that keep us from crossing that line Uh, sadly some people do cross the line but yeah yes they do one of the things also, I want to get to your children. I don't want to forget to get to your children and just ask you how they were affected and your relationship with them was affected. But before I do, I think, you know, you did a lot of stream of consciousness writing and in your, especially in your work with Sonia and even before Sonia, I think. And what you noticed, and I just think this is a fascinating uh, detail, is that your handwriting changed when you went from persona or alter to alter to alter. I have seen that as well. And I just think it it is certainly a very tangible display of of these parts and of the system, as you call it. And so I just think it's it's fascinating. And I remember this woman I'm working with currently couldn't read the handwriting of someone and gradually as synthesis began in, in cooperation yeah. and trust began the the handwriting she could now read it you know it was anyway i just i don't want to go into too much of my work you have three children and so how did you talk to them about this how much did you share how were they affected i actually have four children Ah, so if you read in the very beginning of the book it says uh that i have fictionalized my children in the book uh, the events that I convey all happened. Uh-huh. Uh, but instead of having this many children of these genders, I had this many children of those genders, and I mixed it all up so that just to protect their privacy. Of course, as well. of course, of course. Yeah. So what you read in the book happened, but not necessarily to a male <laughs> or mm-hmm. female, you know, whoever it happened to. Um, so, yeah, I think that in my case, my DID negatively impact my children very much. And there's a number of reasons for that. I will say uh, that I went through a very ugly divorce with my husband, Mm -hmm. and that didn't help. Nope. And and he was decompensating in his own right (laughs) from I don't know what, but, you know, he was very, uh, he went from being what appeared to be kind and loving person to being really abusive to me uh, when I said I would not go back with him. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, but I don't, I don't want to place it all on him because certainly my uh, experience at the time had to be very, very impactful for my kids. First of all, I, I didn't know this at the time, but the part of me that was raising them and loved them was an altar. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, who was a part of Laura, me. You know. Laura, is that Laura right? yes. Mm-hmm. And Laura adored them, wanted nothing more in her life than just to be their mother. And yet when she began to see 
that things were changing at home, that her husband wasn't around as often. She didn't know at the time that he was having an affair. But, you know, when she began to feel things get getting shook up, she sensed danger. And so she disappeared. Mm -hmm. She just disappeared. Got it. And that was heartbreaking because I knew how much I loved my children, but I couldn't, I couldn't feel it, you know, because the altar who held the, that immense love, that capacity, that yes, had, had had disappeared. So, so I knew how to be a good mom. I knew how to do A, B, C, and D, but I couldn't capture the real authentic love that went into that. And and so I was going through it emotionless. I was doing it without emotion. And so we had been so bonded and attached. And then the, that attachment severed, you know, and that had to be hugely impactful for them. And of course, at the time, I didn't know what was going on. I, I didn't know what was going on until until they were much, much older. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, it was very complicated because they were in relationship with their father and with their, their grandparents who had all disowned me. And so I didn't talk to them about, I mean, they knew I was in therapy, but I didn't talk to them about my diagnosis until they were adults. Overall, I'm proud of them for, you know, what they've accomplished and, and the lives they've created for themselves very much so. But I, I think uh, that it has impacted them. And some of them are still probably working through the impact of that in their adult lives now, you know. So um, now that's not true with everyone who has DID and children, because if you're not going through a divorce and you're not, and, and you don't have a situation where the other spouse and and, and the grandparents are doing everything they can to, you know, uh, sabotage you as a person with the ID. It can be a very different scenario. I mean, many people with the ID have extremely supportive spouses, and that really makes a big difference. So I don't think that it has to have that kind of impact on children, but it did with mine, you know, because of the whole collective of the situation. I would imagine that many people have reached out to you since since they read the book, many people with some form of recognition that this is them. How how have you handled that and what has that meant to you? It's extremely <laughs> affirming mm -hmm. and heartwarming. And, and many of the people who reach out to me reach out to me by coming to the writer's workshops, you know. Oh, okay. And, uh, and here, here's an interesting, I'll just share this because I just got it uh, yesterday. I write a weekly blog and I have a number of people who have, you know, subscribed. What, what's the name of the blog? I want to make sure we... Um, well, it's just, it's on my website. It, it So it's just Lynn Barrett, um, uh, dot com, And if you go to uh, lynnbarrett.com, you'll see my blog. I send it out to people who have signed up as a newsletter every week, but you can also find it on my website. I have friends all over the country and they have, you know, they subscribe to my newsletter and blog and, uh, but they don't have DID, you know, they're, they're just interested in keeping in touch with me. And I got a, two weeks ago, I wrote a blog called pain and beauty and uh, somebody uh, from my past life without DID reached out and said, that was such a beautiful blog. Thank you. That, that piece was, so mm -hmm. I, I, I hope that these that my blogs it, it can be meaningful to people without DID too, uh, at least at times. But I would also say, and I want to I want to make sure I say this because I know that we are coming towards the end of our uh, conversation. Uh, because um, earlier in the show, you had mentioned how consensus might be a way to help some of your clients bring their altars uh, to the table. And I, I want to mention that many people with DID do not see integration as their goal. I've heard uh, that. Yeah. And I, I want to, if it's okay with you, I'd like to just talk about that just a little bit, because integration in its, it, I guess, most basic definition really just means that the things that we learn new things, and then we integrate them into who we are. And so when we're healing, whether we remain as multiple, or we, you know, real integrate our personalities, we're all integrating. That's part of the healing process is for our alters to know each other and for 
all of us to integrate it into ourselves, um, this whole story of all of our parts. And so we use the word integration to say that our parts have come together. I have a little bit of a disagreement with some of the big wigs uh, have used a different term for that, and they call it fusion. Yeah. Um, so that's fine if people want to call it fusion. But that makes it sounds to me like you are a steel worker with some kind of a blowtorch and you're fusing, you know, these things together. Yeah. And that is not what it's like. So, so I think the reason why I'm saying this is because people sometimes at different stages of their healing are, are they're really afraid of the idea of integrating, of losing these really important parts. Very important. And you don't lose them. And that's what I want to say. You don't lose them. They are still a part of you. And according to the structural theory of dissociation, they're still there, even though I'm integrated, because that's the way my brain formed when I was a child, but they are dormant. Maybe that's not even a good word. They, they are there. And, and I, st- you know, Mike is there with his assertiveness. And uh, Sylvia is there with, is with her sexuality. Paul is there with her organization. Manny care gives all of that. But it all in my particular case, my alters felt like life would be better if they gave over the executive control to me. Every now and then, one of them pops out and talks to me. So it's not like they have to be gone forever. But for the most part, we are integrated uh, as one person. Some people do choose, uh, their their parts choose to remain in functional multiplicity. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that they have done the integration. They may not want to use that word because it has, you know, a little bit of a a bad taste for some people in the DID community. But but they have integrated uh, with each other in the sense that they know each other, they understand each other, they cooperate and collaborate with each other. And they have also healed the other aspects of abuse. So whether you're DID or not, you know if you've been abused, you have to heal uh, your trust issues, you have to heal your relationship issues, you have to heal your triggers. And so they, they've done their work uh, in all of that, but their alters have said they'd rather remain separate. Right. And, and that is fine. Okay. That's legitimate. Okay. That's called functional multiplicity. So I just wanted to make sure I got that in because it is a big thing in the DID community because not every people have different goals. And some of us don't mm-hmm. have it. My goal was just to heal. <laughs> I just, I, I, I really didn't, I didn't want to necessarily be integrated. I just wanted this to be done. I wanted this to be over. My body was racked and I I wanted to be healed. Yeah. And so that was how my um, Walters did that. Well, I, I want to thank you again. Your book is fabulous. You know, I forgot and left it downstairs. The subtitle is what? I'm just picking it up because I think sure. this is visual. It's crazy. Uh, reclaiming life from the shadow of traumatic memory. That's right. Sorry, I, I didn't remember that. I apologize. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, it's on my coffee table because that's where I sat and read it. Um, thank you so much for such poignant and also, you know, your style in the book is it's it's very easy to read because you have different you italicize certain things and you put quotes around so we know what's going on. And, and I just, I learned so much and thank you for being with uh, the self work listeners today. And um, again, you can be reached at lynnbarrett.com and I I bet you you'll get some people communicating with you because you're, you're a very wise lady. Thank you so much for having me on Margaret. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I wish the best to you and your your clients and and to your listeners, your audience. And hope I hear from some of them. Uh, I I, I answer everybody. So um, if anybody wants to fill out that contact form. uh, I think the funniest thing that that, uh, one of my patients said to me one time when, because she had insurance at the time and I was filing it, she said, she said, can't you file it like five times? For all five of us, and I said, That's "Right, that's right." Oh, really, I don't think so. I don't think that'll go over very well. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn, so very much. Bye bye. I 
I know I learned a lot from listening to Lynn, and I'm sure you did too. One of the takeaways of Lynn's testimony as to what her life was like, the parts of her that had talents and skills, and then the parts of her that were extremely vulnerable. If you have substantive and severe childhood abuse in your past, then this can happen to you. It can happen to anyone. And again, it's so important to realize that the splitting that occurs, the creation of separate identities or altars, is actually highly, highly protective. As always, thanks for being here today. I always appreciate the ratings and reviews you've left for either my book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, on Amazon, or, of course, the podcast itself, here at SelfWork. You can go to my website at drmargaretrutherford.com and subscribe and you'll get a weekly newsletter that's the easiest way really to keep in touch with me and to know what's going on, at least in my world. I'd love to have you there. Or you can email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com or use the speak pipe feature that you can find in the show notes as well as on my website and leave me a voicemail message so I can listen to you and feature your voicemail on the episode. Again, thank you for being here. Please take very good care of yourself, those you love, and your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.